Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 342. What a conversation we have today. I'm sorry my voice is still not fully recovered, but good enough to be understood anyway. We're talking today to Dr. Lance Dotus, author most recently of the book The Sober Truth, debunking the bad science behind 12-step programs and the rehab industry. He is an iconoclast in this way because, of course, we all know the pedestal on which AA and so-called rehab are placed in our society. So I thought, well, my, my audience is iconoclastic. Let's talk to Dr. Dotus. Dr. Lance Dotus is a training and supervising analyst emeritus with the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. He recently retired as the assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's also previously been director of the substance abuse treatment unit of Harvard's McLean Hospital, director of the alcoholism treatment unit at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, which is now part of Mass General, and director of the Boston Center for Problem Gambling. Dr. Dotus is the author of other books as well, Breaking Addiction, a seven-step handbook for ending any addiction, The Heart of Addiction, A New Approach to Understanding and Managing Alcoholism and Other Addictive Behaviors, and of course the book The Sober Truth we're going to be talking about today. Check out all that stuff over at tomwoods.com slash 342. Dr. Dotus has also been elected a Distinguished Fellow of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. So, let's talk to Dr. Dotus now. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Dr. Dotus, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I have not myself gone through a 12-step program, but I know people who have, and I think probably all of us know somebody who has. They are ubiquitous. The 12-step approach, as you note in, in your book, The Sober Truth, has gone from an approach that we apply to alcoholism to all kinds of different problems. In fact, apparently even vulgarity. There are people who go through a 12-step program, and I don't know what that would even consist of. What I want to know at the very beginning here is how it's possible. Just, I know this is really partly what your whole book is about. Just give me the two minute answer how it's possible that this program, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in particular, having such a low success rate, is nevertheless completely entrenched throughout American society to the point where everybody turns to it when they've got somebody who's in trouble with alcohol. Well, uh, as, as we talked about in the book, when AA began in the 1930s, uh, it was extremely unpopular at the very start. Uh, people who are professionals in the field labeled it as, as ridiculous. Uh, but by 10 years or so later, in the 1940s, it had become enormously popular. And what happened was that a few folks who were friends of AA uh, such as the columnist Jack Anderson, who was the most important columnist in the country at that time, wrote glowing reviews based on really nothing. Uh, they just uh, knew a few people who had done well, and they said this is a miracle cure. Uh, and when you couple that with the fact that there were, really wasn't very much uh, else to treat uh, alcoholism or addictions in general, uh, people grasped at this. It was a. It was. Uh, uh, it was something that people wanted to have be successful. So over the years, it became more and more uh, successful. With again, without really any evidence, and uh, the low success rate turned out to be uh, actually a large number of people. So that the success rate, which is between five and eight percent, still amounts to a lot of people. So the second thing that happens is those people proselytize. That actually is the 12th step of the 12 steps, is we will go forth and spread the word. And so those people who are intensely devoted to AA because it's helped them uh, um, reach out to others, and they often obtain important positions in the addiction treatment world, and then they control what happens from there. For example, state uh, addiction or alcoholism programs are almost all run by AA people. Uh, and they don't, uh, you know, like a lot of uh, people with a kind of a closed police belief system, they don't really listen to any other data or information. They just propose what they propose. So it's become enormously popular. And the reason we wrote the book is because 
there have been a, uh, a handful of studies that purported to show that AA really is, is more successful than it is. So we wanted to look very carefully at those studies scientifically. And what we found is that they were really awful from a scientific standpoint. And um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fact that AA just doesn't work well for most people um, is, is simply unknown. So we wanted to make that clear. And then, of course, the other thing is that there are other and uh, better ways of approaching alcoholism. I like the point you made in the book that the the whole AA establishment blames you <laughs> if you're not successful. They they don't blame the the program. They say anybody who has successfully gone through our program and who has really applied himself, we've not known anyone to fail. But if they do fail, well, then they're not really applying themselves. And you point out that there is no other aspect of science or medicine in which if in, in which we could apply that kind of logic without being laughed out of court. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the uh, uh, the notion that if you work at it, it works, which has been a popular slogan in AA, and it's even the title of a new book, is utter nonsense. It's circular reasoning. The fact is that if you look at the studies, uh, the the small percentage of people who do well do well. That's all that they show, uh, and uh, the the rest of the people are judged as as failing to do to to work the program i can't tell you the number of people who've written in uh, in response to either either the sober truth either the book or or uh, my uh, blog on uh, psychology today which is called the heart of addiction which is the title of another book of mine um and to say look what you're saying can't be right because these people who aren't uh, doing well simply haven't worked the whole program it's as you say. It's it's a condemnation of people who don't do well. I'm sure we would all love to be able to say that about anything else that we like personally. You know, if you don't if you don't like what I am saying, it must be your fault. Uh, and it's it's just unconscionable, really. Now you have more than ample credentials, to put it mildly, uh, emeritus at Harvard Medical School, to be making the statements that you're making here. And it makes me wonder: Has this been the relationship between the professional establishment among psychologists over the years with AA, where you've got AA, and on a popular level, everybody loves it, but at a scientific level, everybody knows it's bunk? Or are you even an outlier among your fellow professionals? <clears throat> well, I, I, I wouldn't exactly say I'm an outlier, because there are enough people who are professionals who are aware of the defects in, in AA, which, again, doesn't mean it doesn't help anybody. It helps, you know, 5 to 8%. Um, but uh, there are plenty of professionals who are either devoted to AA uh, because of personal experience or they are devoted to it because they have rested their careers on it. There are people who have written uh, the, these really poorly done studies that I have uh, wrote about in the book whose careers depend upon the proof, the, I'm sorry, the truth of what they are saying. And so it's an existential threat to them to, to challenge that. Furthermore, most of the treatment programs in the country are 12-step based. So it's a threat to everybody who runs those programs and who uh, makes money from those programs and who works in those programs. Most of the counselors, for example, in the 12-step rehabs, which dot the country, are people who uh, are either recovering alcoholics in, in AA or they have been trained in the uh, 12 steps. And those programs and those people need to believe that what they are doing is the best or even sometimes the only treatment. And uh, so, uh, yeah, there are there is an enormous uh, kind of city hall that you're fighting against if you want to bring uh, the facts about AA to light. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the background of the history of AA and this guy, Bill Wilson, how the whole thing got started? Can that shed light on the program, knowing what the origins of it are? I, I, you would hope so. Bill Wilson started AA. He wrote the book Alcoholics Anonymous in the 1930s. And incidentally, AA has hardly changed at all since then. It, 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 it is the only area of psychiatry, psychology, or medicine that is exactly unchanged since the 1930s. Um, he started it because he was uh, he had alcoholism, and one day he said he had a hallucinatory experience, uh, 
Incidentally, he was on hallucinogens at the time because they were, that's what they treated things with in those days. But uh, he had a hallucinatory experience that God appeared to him and basically said, uh, uh, don't drink. That's a kind of a summary of it. But the point is, he said, aha, I have seen the light. And what I need to do is now bring this message to, to, to all fellow sufferers. And the AA steps themselves came from a group that Bill Wilson belonged to called the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group was founded in around the turn of the 20th century uh, and was a fundamentalist Christian group based on first century Christian tradition, which said basically that the ills of mankind are due to being distant from God. And that is exactly where Bill Wilson got his 12 steps from, which, which he, he said. So the 12 steps, which are about turning to God or a higher power and turning your life over to the higher power and basically um, uh, getting closer to a higher power was an exact repetition of the, the Oxford group. And um, so that's how he that's how he uh, he developed the program. Importantly to me, although Bill Wilson stopped drinking, he had multiple other addictive and compulsive behaviors, which he had for the rest of his life. And in fact, ultimately killed him. He was a, uh, a terrible uh, cigarette smoker and he died of lung disease. And uh, he was also a uh, womanizer. This is well known. So as a person interested in psychology and psychoanalysis, it, the thing that I have been mainly working on for the past 30 years is uh, understanding the psychology of addiction. And when you understand it, you see that there is nothing magical about alcohol, that this is a compul alcoholism is a compulsive behavior, which is the same as compulsions to gamble or compulsions to use the Internet or even compulsions that we don't think of as addictions, like a compulsion to clean your house. Psychologically, these are all the same. So it's important to understanding Bill Wilson that although he stopped drinking, he never really treated his problem. He just switched over to other compulsive behaviors, which is a very common thing. So his idea that he had come up with this spiritual solution to alcoholism was, was never true. Wow, that's very interesting. So, so I've heard that before. That, In fact, my wife sometimes says that if, if somebody has one addictive behavior, they're probably— one or two more that are hidden somewhere or just beneath the surface or we're not aware of. And so it looks like, as you're saying, in his case, he simply replaces one for another and doesn't get to the root cause of what's causing the compulsion in the first place. Now, what to, to what extent does AA or the rehab uh, industry, as we might call it, feed into the idea of alcoholism in particular as a disease? And what is your feeling on that? Well, the disease idea started with uh, Betty Ford, really, in the 1970s. And the useful thing about it was that it tended to take away the stigma of having an addiction, which is good. There shouldn't be a stigma associated with it. It basically said, you're not bad or weak or, or hedonistic. You, you're sick. You have an illness. To that extent, it was useful. The problem with it is that, first of all, alcoholism is not a disease. But besides that, it ended up being a kind of a black box explanation. People stopped thinking about what alcoholism or addiction really is. They just said, it's a disease. You couldn't get them to define what the disease was, what the cause of it was, or anything about it. They just labeled it, and that stopped their thinking. Um, so that's where it's it's been not useful. Uh, the uh, As I said, the real issue behind addiction is, 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 is that it's a compulsive psychological behavior. It's a symptom, really. It's no more and no less than a symptom, like other compulsions. And it can be understood that way and treated that way. My first book, The Heart of Addiction, described that. Of course, I'd written academic papers about it, but my first general audience book was The Heart of Addiction. And then I wrote a book called Breaking Addiction, which described a step-by-step -step way of dealing with addiction by understanding it psychologically. And then I wrote The Sober Truth with my colleague because uh, so much of, of the country was basically ignoring the deeper meaning and, and, and uh, 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 understanding of addiction uh, because they were just blinded by these 12 steps. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, it's very common. For, for example, let me give you a simple example. It's very common for people to not only switch from uh, compulsive uh, use of alcohol, which we call alcoholism, to a compulsive use of a completely different drug, like cocaine. That's common enough. But it's also common to switch from a drug addiction to a non-drug addiction, like compulsive gambling or compulsive eating. Uh, or any of the other kinds of uh, addictions that are not drug addictions. Um, so the, that very fact should have clued people into the idea that drugs have nothing to do with addiction, really. I mean, there are lots of drug addictions, but they have nothing inherently to do with the nature of addiction because people switch in and out of drug addictions all the time. It has to do with the drive to take the drug or to do the activity, like gamble or clean your house. That's where it's at. And once you understand things that way, uh, you can understand a, a lot more about a person uh, because as a symptom, it's really just a solution to a problem that already exists inside the person, just as it did inside of Bill Wilson. He had issues, which he dealt with first by drinking and later by womanizing and smoking. I definitely want to pursue that a bit more, but before I forget, I want to talk about a section of your book called The Rehab Fiction, because if there's anything that has as much purchase on the American mind as AA, it's the idea of going to rehab, going to some institution that will keep you there for 30 or 60 or 90 days. And as you say in the book, you get the impression that this must be a good idea because it involves doing something. It involves activity. It involves a commitment. It involves a systematic series of, of steps. And we all feel like this is the natural and indeed the only approach one can take. If you don't go to rehab, you're never going to get over your addiction. Most people, I think, believe that. And yet what you're saying is the whole rehab industry, by and large, seems to have been a tremendous failure. Oh, it is a tremendous failure. There's no question about it. Most rehabs will not publish their findings, their outcome findings. Uh, in fact, actually, most of them don't even bother to, to check because I, I think they know what the result would be. We did find only uh, uh, one study, a uh, uh, follow-up study from a person, uh, not I mean from people who came out of rehab. That was at Hazelden Rehabilitation Center, which is now part of Betty Ford. Um, the, uh, the study, though, had exactly the same flaws as all the other studies showing uh, success. The biggest flaw is that they simply ignored data that didn't fit their conclusion, which is a big no-no in science. Uh, almost um, uh, the great majority of people who are in these studies, including the outcome studies from rehabs, drop out. And the reason they drop out is uh, they don't do well. So they have no interest in returning or, or answering phone calls or anything like that. But the people who do well are delighted to tell you about it. So what happens is that they draw conclusions from the tiny percentage of people that they get data from, and then they generalize it to everybody. You can't do that in science. That's not fair. Uh, so we know that the success rate, even from the, using their data, is really very bad. The majority, for example, even in this one study from Hazelden, the great majority of people at the one-year mark had returned to heavy drinking. So it doesn't work. From my standpoint, what's really interesting is that there is no reason why it should work. I mean, taking people out of their environment is, is fine to give them a break if they need it. But you can go to, a, you know, any place to do that. You don't have to go to a, a thirty to $90,000 a month rehab to do that. And if you look at what they offer in these rehabs, which we did uh, because it's public information, we, we, we actually published the daily schedules from uh, Betty Ford and uh, – uh, and uh, Hazelden. Um, if you look at what they're actually charging people all this money for, it's mostly nonsense. They have AA meetings because they're 12 step programs, <clears throat> but the rest of it is things like meditation, it's exercise, it's doing therapeutic tasks, you know, cleaning up things around the house or, I mean, around the rehab, writing out the 12 steps, you know. These are things which are either have no scientific basis or you can do at home. You can do for free by going to AA, for example. And because they, these high-end rehabs, which charge all this money, compete with each other, they offer uh, 
uh, gourmet services in order to to uh, 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 place uh, in order to compete better. They offer gourmet food. They offer luxurious settings. If you go to any of these websites, they'll tell you about the beautiful mountains around them or the desert. Um, they'll tell you about their giving uh, alleged treatments such as horse therapy, which is you know being around a horse. Um, or gigjong therapy, which is described as helping your immune system. It's, you know, it's, there's no scientific basis for this stuff. Uh, one of them, Passages Malibu, which charges $90,000 a month, uh, what you get for all that money is you get a ride on their yacht, which is called the Safe Passage. So if, if you ask them, what is the possible relevance to treating addiction of getting a ride on a yacht? They say, well, it gives you the experience of what sober living could be. So this, this, is what, this is what these places are. A good rehab, which, and there, are, I really have been looking hard, and I haven't really been able to find one that I can truly endorse. The, a good rehab, first of all, would cost much less money. And people, one of the real tragedies of this is that because they're so expensive and they're not covered by insurance, People often spend their life savings trying to help themselves or a loved one, sometimes a child, uh, getting them into this expensive place. And they figure if it's this expensive, it must be good. And then when they come out and they resume drinking or, or, or taking drugs, everyone is disappointed in them. It repeats the problem with AA that, you know, you fail if the treatment fails. And now these people have spent all this money. So they're angry at the person who hasn't done well. So that's that's a tremendous uh, tragedy from these from these places. So so you would uh, say without a doubt you should not go to one of these places. You should not go to rehab if you have one of these problems. You should do something else, but not that. Well, sometimes people need a timeout. Uh, you okay, know, but because that's they, a different thing. They don't need it in this kind of institutional setting. That's right. And sometimes people need detox, which is a medical treatment. So <clears throat> most detoxes, de that's detoxification from the, if you're on a drug, uh, if you're physically addicted to a drug, that usually takes only a matter of days. Um, an ideal rehab would be, first of all, shorter. There's nothing magical about 30 days. It, it, the reason the 30-day rehabs happen is because when insurance used to cover rehabs, they uh, eventually decided they weren't going to cover more than 30 days. So that magically became the right number of days to be in a rehab. Um, but if anyone has to go in, I would certainly suggest look for a place that is closer to 10 days or maybe two weeks just to get a break. Look for a place that explicitly does not offer you these extra things which you're spending money on, which have no scientific value. Spend as little as you can to get a decent place. And try, unless you are in that 5% that loves AA, try to avoid an AA program. And there are an increasing number of programs that are not 12-step based, which is, which is good. So I would say find a non-12-step program, unless you're in that small group, um, that lasts only 10 or 14 days. But the most important thing is going to be to have follow-up with a very good therapist, somebody who understands addiction and you know, truthfully understands the psychology of addiction, who can help you work through what this is all about. Well, before I let you go, let me make sure I'm, I, I've am i got a handle on what the real problem with, with AA is. I mean, there are some, some aspects of it that seem harmless enough, like making amends to people, although even that is, again, suggesting a moral culpability here. Some moral failing is at the heart of your addiction. But it seems that the, the program is a program of more or less constant abasement Whereas what we should, ought to want to do is try to get to the heart of not is it, not what is it that's driving me to drink in particular, but rather to behave compulsively. What, what is the origin of this? And if I can get to the heart of it and I can be aware of that, then I might have some hope of getting rid of these addictions. Well, that's right. I, I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to be too harsh on AA. I mean, the, the abasement part is certainly part of it, but... If you talk to AA people who like it, they will say that's not true. They'll say, I don't feel abased by it. I feel as though, for example, taking the step forward, taking a fearless moral inventory was helpful. Uh, you know, it, one of the important things to understand about AA is that it's completely unregulated. Every group is, is different from every other group. So there are groups that are not that bad. You know, they're, they're run by mature people. They are, they are intended to be what 
the, the main thing that makes AA work at all is that it's a group support system. So they get group support, which is fine. That's, that's okay. The problem is that there are plenty of groups run by immature people who are rigid and moralistic, and they, are, they do debase people who come in and they treat them as if they are uh, 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 you know, uh, hedonistic or bad and they have to get with the program. So I don't want to paint all of a, a with the same brush. And again, that itself is an issue. When you go to AA, you, have, you just don't know what you're going to get, which is, by the way, another reason why the 12 steps themselves are really uh, are not a, a kind of a treatment at all, because it doesn't depend on the 12 steps. It actually depends on the group of people you're with. And so there are a lot of other groups that are helpful to people, too, uh, but don't depend on the 12, 12 steps. Um, the other problem, of course, with AA is that um, it, uh, it, it, it has been fairly close-minded about encouraging people to do other things, whether it's taking uh, medication, if that would help, or uh, seeing a good therapist. Not all AA groups are the same, and some are better than others in that, in that way, uh, too. And then, of course, there's the issue with AA that um, since they tell you that you should be working the program harder, we know of many tragedies of people who've spent years or even decades going back and back to AA and don't get better, and they are never really referred out. No one in AA ever says, this is not for you, go somewhere else, which is, of course, a regular practice in medicine. They say, this medicine isn't good for you, try something else. Well, I'm going to make sure and link on our show notes page to both the book we've been talking about today, which is The Sober Truth, Debunking the Bad Science Behind 12-Step Programs and the Rehab Industry. We'll also link to The Heart of Addiction. Uh, the show notes page for today, this being episode 342, will be tomwoods.com slash 342. Do you have a website I can also direct people to? Sure. It's just lancedotis.com. And um, uh, thank you for mentioning my first book. And the, the second book was called Breaking Addiction. So there, there are three books all together, and I think that they um, you know, they, they're each a, a, a bit different from each other. So thanks for mentioning them. I'll certainly link to all three of them then at uh, tomwoods.com slash 342. I'll link to your personal site, which is lance, D-O-D-E-S dot com. And I appreciate your time today. Very interesting and important subject handled in an absolutely devastating way. I mean, you are just slicing and dicing bad studies, bad methodology, in this work of yours, uh, The Sober Truth. Uh, congratulations. I mean, it was just an absolute thrill to read it. Well, thank you so much. All right, everybody, an announcement here. I am going on a cruise. I've never gone on a cruise without my wife before. This is totally bizarre. But there is a cruise going on for some of the people who, in one way or another, were involved in the Ron Paul movement. And I'm going. I'm leaving tomorrow. That's why I'm going to be in Houston tomorrow night doing an event the 18th, February 18th, 2015, um, doing a little event before we actually leave for the cruise. I'm going to be rooming with Bob Murphy, frequent guest of this program. So that's just got reality show written all over it. I was not planning to have... Well, first my plan was have fresh new episodes for you guys. And then I thought, no, there's no way I'll have time to do episodes because I've just had a lot going on in my household and it's been too hard. But I will have episodes. It's going to be material you've never heard before, and material that I'm fairly pleased with, but it won't involve guests. So I've got some things lined up for while I'm gone, so you almost won't notice that I'm not here, but that's what's going to be going on. Of course, if you enjoy this show, you'll enjoy my new book, Real Dissent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Check that out at realdissent.com, and of course, get a copy of the audiobook version with me reading it, via tomwoodsaudio.com. You can actually get a free copy of the audiobook version via the offer you can get to through tomwoodsaudio.com. And of course, the Kindle version of that book is one of the perks you get as a supporting listener of the show, so please consider doing that, supportinglisteners.com. See you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show. 